I want to call the Finance Committee meeting to order for Finance Committee for May 7, 2019, 2 p.m. And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, a couple things. First of all, ignore the Play the names in front of us because uh, we didn't move the uh, labels from uh, last night's meeting, which lasted pretty late at night. Um, but anyway, um, I'm Andy Steinberg. I'm chair of the Finance Committee. There are four out of five members of the Finance Committee present here today. Um, and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment when they're in front of microphones. Um, one member was unable to attend because she unfortunately had to attend a funeral today and uh, therefore um, is out of town. Um, and then we have one additional member of the um, council present, um, Pat D'Angelis, and is sitting actually in the correct position according to your name play from last night. Um, and uh, we have posted this as a council meeting. If more counselors come and there ends up being a quorum of the councilor, then president um, of the council will, will uh, call a meeting to order of the council. But otherwise, this is just a meeting of the Finance Committee, and I appreciate everybody being here. Um, the process this year is our first time for the council in um, establishing the budget process. And uh, I appreciate seeing uh, at least one friendly face from our old finance committee present here. Uh, the the uh, rules that we will be operating with this year are a little different when we get to actually considering the budget. Um, because the voting procedure at uh, the council is under different rules than, the ca than applied at uh, town meeting, but the finance committee is trying to do a fairly similar role of reviewing the budget section by section and then um, uh, being, making a recommendation to the council as a whole. So having, with that introduction, um, now, Turn it to just let my colleagues on the committee introduce themselves. Shalini behel Mel, member of Finance Committee and District 5 uh, Counselor. Kathy Shane on Finance, District 1. Lynn Griesmer, uh, Town Council President in District 2. And uh, I previously introduced myself. The only thing I didn't say is that I'm a counselor at large, um, which meant that I'm one of the three people who was elected townwide as opposed to in a district. Um, going uh, then to um, actually the review of the budget, I don't know if uh, town manager, did, did you have a, a recommended order that you would like to suggest that we review departments in, and do you have any introductory comments? Uh, the order we would like to do is police, fire, uh, and then I think health and council on aging, and then LSSE. I think, or no, LSSE is gonna go earlier because there's a commitment there, so. Who's taking notes? Okay. Um, can you take the, uh, Yes, we do have a volunteer minute taker for the moment. This is oh. the nun going. No, I'll take care of it. minutes for uh, Margaret will be here shortly. Good. Okay. Yeah. As we noted earlier, uh, we're not calling a council meeting at this point because there's not a quorum present okay. and we don't know whether we'll get one or not and I explained that already. So um, we're going to start with the police department. I guess I'll, uh, Chief Livingstone. And, and, and your team and okay, so I think that um, what you're probably going to be talking about is actually several sections of the budget, starting I assume with the police department itself, communications, 
animal welfare, and I don't know if you're going to do the police facility building, if any comments on that. Um, but those, those are, they're actually four sections as there have been in prior budgets. So that's correct. Uh, Scott Livingstone, police chief. I brought with me Captain Gabe Ting, who oversees operations, and Captain Ron Young, who is the um, captain of um, administration. So they may. Um, they're open to questions or answers as, as well as myself. So do you have a pre preference, Mr. Steinberg? Do you want to do animal welfare? No, I, no I, uh, since you have uh, two officers, uh, senior staff with you, who probably have other things they want to get to, why don't we start with the Sounds good. police budget itself. Sure, so starting out with the uh, police budget and facilities, the facilities part of it, I can probably answer questions if there are questions about the facility, but I don't actually have too, too much um, say over the actual budgeting of the facility other than to give input about what types of things need to be replaced and at what time frame, but if there are questions about that, I'd be more than happy to answer those as well to the best of my ability. Okay. Um, from the purposes of the Police budget, um, going through, uh, you saw in the pie chart about 95% or so is directed towards personnel. Um, we are currently budgeted at 48 police officers and we have one that is a grant funded position through a domestic violence grant that we um, are in our fourth year, I think, of domestic violence grant. It's a grant that we work with the University of Massachusetts with the town of Hadley, which funds a full-time police officer and also funds a civilian advocate that we use in our facility to deal with domestic violence issues. So 48 budgeted and one um, domestic violence grant funded position for a total of 49 police officers. Currently though, we have four vacancies. Three of those vacancies are attributed to officers leaving for other agencies. Um, Captain Gun Jen Gunderson left for the South Hadley Police Chief's position. Um, Officer Sam Hebb la left to take a position with the Rhode Island State Police. Officer Mike Boyle left to take a position with the United States Postal Services. So that's where we stand as far as personnel. Um, if there are specific questions, uh, Mr. Steinberg, do you just want to stop at any time? Otherwise, I'll just go through some of the Quickly, I know we want to keep this to five minutes or so, but um, status <coughs> updates yeah. of objectives, that sort of thing. Yeah, I would say why don't you proceed, and then afterwards, uh, there were, uh, I'll turn to my colleagues on the committee and uh, to Councilor DeAngelis to see if there are any questions um, when you've completed your presentation. Sure. So just as far as long-range objectives, quickly, um, when we get up to full staffing, we have three officers that will be attending the Police Academy on June 4th in Springfield. That academy lasts about 22 weeks, so it'll be some time before those officers actually graduate and are on the street working. So we'll be with those vacancies for the better part of 2019. Um, when we get to up to speed, you know, some of our long-range objectives is to get up to staffing. We get a lot of requests for traffic issues and that sort of thing, so officers running radar, responding to accidents. Um, those really aren't being fulfilled to the ability that we want to do. So um, as far as update on objectives from 2019, a lot of our community outreach, which involves our crisis intervention team and our work with the University of Massachusetts to diffuse and reduce the number of quality of life calls is going well. Um, have accomplished both of those as you see. Um, conducting comprehensive re review of our policies, that's something that we need to do and we will do when it's quieter time in the summertime comes. That's an internal process, it's just something that we know that we need to do and will accomplish over the summer. Uh, we know um, with the upcoming licensing of recreational marijuana, we're going to be dealing more with uh, crash related instances in specific to uh, impaired driving, um, having conversations with our colleagues out in Denver and Washington and Oregon State, we know that that's going to happen more frequently. Officers are currently being trained as we speak uh, about recognizing impairment specific to marijuana usage and other impairments. So 
That is something that we are aware of and we are training for and we'll be concentrating more directly with. Um, continuing to work with all of our town departments, school departments, uh, Alice training, active shooter training, response to critical incidents. We are doing that uh, on an ongoing basis. As a matter of fact, we'll be down at the Crocker Farm Schools this week, um, next week, tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Um, that is the last school that we have to get up to speed as far as our active trainer, active uh, response training in regards to school safety. Um, and SEPTED, we're continuing our work with uh, Officer Bill Laramie and our community outreach officers just to, again, reach out to neighborhoods that are affected by student activity and student housing. We've had great accomplishments and great successes in North Amherst. We've um, filtered that down to the Phillips and Farring Street area, and now our next um, location that we're going to be working with is Lower Main Street and the Main Street corridors where we've been seeing an mm -hmm. uptick in student and quality of life issues. So that is uh, next on our objective as far as um, work to do on uh, neighborhoods that we're having issues with. So uh, overall, though, you know, that, that um, the work that Bill Laramie is doing with UMass uh, administration is going outstanding, and I couldn't be happier with the way that's going. So questions, um, anything you want me to hit more specifically about? Um, uh, I know we're trying well, to one, one comment just uh, from having been many years, no longer, but many years on the uh, Campus and Community Coalition, I really do appreciate Officer uh, Laramie's work and the SEPTED program. Uh, I think it was one of our really great accomplishments and it's really, um, he deserves tremendous recognition and appreciation for that effort. Um, I, I think that I, I appreciate you bringing up the marijuana concern because yes. that was one major concern going forward about changes and um, whether there were any, obviously we'd also be interested whether there are any budget concerns that come out of any of this. The other things that I was um, always interested in is whether um, the challenges of working with the homeless have in any way changed and how they've affected the department and its operations. And um, there's the additional question that we is beginning to come before the um, council. So, and um, that is whether there's going to be any um, known concerns about the, if the um, proposal goes forward for the SRO um, residential single uh, residence occupants um, program, uh, project that Valley CDC is proposing for College Street and whether um, that causes any concerns for the department and for um, uh, either workload or staffing. You know, from you know, speaking about the homeless issue, issue um, and it's I, not one that I just intentionally kind of <laughs> fluffed over because it's an area that we have Officer Casey Nagel, who's assigned to the downtown mm -hmm. district, and we have four officers who are liaisons to the shelter. When the shelter is open, the shelter is now closed. There's probably not a day that goes by where we don't respond to a call that involves a homeless uh, individual. Um, not always a you know, a, a problematic type call, but sometimes issues of where they're sleeping, where they're staying, uh, sometimes being a nuisance. But there are specific individuals we deal with constantly who, you know, sometimes are arrested. And, you know, we deal with those individuals and do the best that we can to get them the help that they need. That being said, I think we, as a town, and it would be very beneficial to the police department and EMS people as well, if the individuals have permanent residency and however we reach that uh, will make everybody's lives easier. Of course, those individuals who are homeless first and foremost, but um, what we see is once the shelter closes for the season, um, there, are no, there are no places for the individuals to stay. So they end up camping out in various locations, whether it's the West Cemetery or the rear of the Jones Library, there's a little outpost behind the big way shopping center and those are areas that we patrol and we get sent to. So I think long-term goals as a town, we need to really do a better job of trying to find permanent residency for these individuals. 
Um, so I'll, whatever we can do as an agency to whether discuss that, talk about that, or, or be involved in that, um, certainly we would want to be part of that solution. Lynn? Um, if you were to look back over the last five years or so, would you say that our homeless population has increased or remained steady, decreased? What would you say is the trend? I mean, I, this, Please speak to the mic. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Um, I, one of the things that's a, is kind of an interesting dynamic is, is because of the way our shelter is set up, um, we, we receive almost a daily influx of people that come to town because they can receive services and then they'll stay for the evening hours and then they'll leave town and go elsewhere. Um, so that's a long way of saying I think there's been an increase, but it's very hard to quantitate simply because it really has, by definition, it's a transient population, but it's even more transient because it happens on a per diem basis as opposed over the course of the, the season. So I know that our call activity is definitely increased. That, that is, you know, those are numbers that we could produce. Um, the number of, you know, actually people who are impacted by homelessness, I think it, it's increased, but it's, it's hard to kind of modulate and really define what that is. Shelly? So, so one thing I'm really happy to hear that you also, you feel that having, uh, providing a home to the homeless is actually going to be not only good for them, but also for you, good for you. Um, um, one additional question would be if, if there's a concentration of people living um, um, in these SROs, does that impact the neighborhood in any way? I think the best way to answer that is looking at past histories that we've had with problem properties and very successful properties. And from our perspective, what it comes down to is management. So if we have good management at these sites, who work cooperatively with the police, fire, uh, health department, and we'll have a successful location. Um, it's really about communication and just working together to make sure those properties are successful. Um, I, I, I want to stay with this topic a little bit, but I want to build on one of the other questions, Andy. Should, should we stay with homeless? Uh, you, yeah. Your call. Your okay. Well, one question I had, and you might not know, and I saw Ella Social Services mm -hmm. was also raised this. Do you have any sense of um, are, is, are most of the homeless that are in Amherst fairly long-term Amherst residents that something has hit them and they've lost their home? Um, or is it a more transient population? Is there any way of knowing from what you're seeing, um, who's using the shelter? Do we see them year after year after year kind of thing? and Or do even the people yeah. change? Gabe, what would you say? I mean, I can speak to that a little sure. bit. So our liaison officers really try to do a good job in getting to know each individual um, that are at the shelter. They kind of make it their, their purpose to get to know what their background is, where they are, in that way, in order to develop that relationship, we can kind of steer them in the correct direction and try and gather the correct services for them. So unfortunately, you have, a, you have a huge array. You have a mix of different people. You know, the programs that we have here in town are so good that news actually travels. And we get a lot of transient people. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. We, we gather a lot of different transient people from many other communities and you have a vast array of circumstances from each individual homeless person some of them are coming from situations where they may have lost a job and it's a temporary solution others have much more complex issues such as uh, dependency issues um, that have helped to foster the situation that they're in so it's that's that also is really difficult to quantify it's almost on an individual basis but um, one thing that's been constant is we do see uh, every single year a whole host of new faces. And they're literally coming from everywhere, outside of the state as well. Lynn? Nope, she didn't. I was going to kind of move to a larger observation. When I look at your the chart of the different kinds of violations and so forth, it ends at FY18, but some of them show some trends uh, upward. 
and to just ask you, you know, what do you see as the growing areas of concern when it comes to violations? Did you have one specific? Um, no. Even, you know, even, even the first line goes yeah, up. Yep. Yeah. So just general calls for service, you know, that fluctuates from year to year. And you saw FY15 being one of our lower ones. We've been as high going back nine or eight, nine or 10 years, or, um, just when I was about coming on board as chief, I believe it was in the 20 to 21,000 calls uh, annually. Um, a lot of the types of calls and, and or arrests you may see in that chart are sometimes officer driven. So if we're trying to establish better behavior, we may flood an area and, and request this, you know, that people behave better and in the course of trying to get them to behave better, sometimes it involves arrest or more outreach than necessary. So the fact that you may see alcohol arrest up doesn't necessarily signify bad behavior. It may be that we're concentrating our efforts to try and um, you know, get better behavior in a specific neighborhood. Um, so I don't get too, too alarmed about that. Um, sexual assaults fluctuates a lot. Um, again, our domestic violence advocate does a fabulous job and she's there for us all the time, 24 seven. Um, so those are hard to give an explanation from one year to the next about why there are more. Do you, on a topic like medical assist, I was mm -hmm. also looking at ambulance and was gonna ask this on this. Is that um, senior, senior related homebound? I mean, I don't know when, the, when you get called in a medical assist versus an ambulance and an EMS? Well, not necessarily. I mean, we have seen a significant uptick in the number of medical mental responses that we're having. And these are more types of calls for people in crisis um, and some of the calls that you see there will be, there's a, let's say, there's a specific individual we probably have responded to this in this past year over 100 times. So one individual may make a big uptick in the types of calls. Um, but that being said, medical mental calls have increased significantly, not just in Amherst, but when I speak with other police chiefs and you know, colleagues, it's pretty much consistently um, at least in Massachusetts, an area where we're seeing a larger number of responses. There aren't a lot of services out there, so the first thing people do are call the police to get the ball rolling on trying to A, get somebody out of a dangerous situation, or B, try and find a problem as problem solvers. That's kind of where they start. So that's... that's uh, when you, when, can I follow up on that? When you get a concentration like that, a person, do we have an Amherst, I mean, that after you is you know, community service, or is there a linkage where you can, let's get someone in the middle of this to, tr to try to figure out how to prevent it becoming an emergency? Sure. Uh, yeah. Ronnie, do you want to speak on our CIT officers who are specifically trained to try and find resources? We do, and, and, and it kind of ties into the question about the numbers as well. A large part of the, the members of our CIT team, our crisis intervention trick team, they respond sometimes when, um, not sometimes, very often call driven, 911 driven. But we also have a, a program in place where we go back when people are not in crisis. And that's kind of a service gathering um, thing. And it, we've really had great fortune with that. Not only does it kind of forge a relationship with people in the community, but we've been able to tie them in depending on where they're from and where they work um, with things that can actually give them real assistance in the future. Something more than a police officer arriving as a result of a 911 call. So some of the numbers that we see that are related to medical mental calls are actually not us responding to people in crisis, but responding for aftercare. Anything else on police? Um, just, just, you, you asked oh, a question at the beginning, Andy, um, about marijuana, um, and I had both, you know, you said you anticipated some issues. Mm. Yes. Um, Marijuana gets treated differently than alcohol in terms of driver's license. Is that correct? Or you know, if you, you know, driving while well under the influence. Um, well, not any longer. What they did when they changed the marijuana laws about just mere possession. So, if, you know, it used to be if you had it on your possession, not driving, nothing to do with operating a vehicle. You know, there was criminal charges that could be brought, and they've done away with it. It's now now non-criminal. It was now non-criminal, and now it's actually legal to. Um, to, to possess certain amounts. Where it becomes a problem is when people are, people are operating a motor vehicle now and the 
penalties are going to be the same. The problem we don't have, the problem we have is, A, officers aren't trained yet. We are in the process of training officers how to recognize it and what further makes it a, a more, uh, a bigger issue for police departments is how to test for it. So, you, you know, it's pretty easy to recognize when somebody's under the influence of something. Then trying to prove that in court and get the, pe the help that people need is another story. So that's the area where we haven't really figured out what we're going to do. And by we, I don't necessarily mean the police department, but the Commonwealth. Just to add to that real quickly, uh, one difference when you compare alcohol impairment in comparison to drug impairment or impairment with marijuana is at this time, you know, there's a breathalyzer machine to try and test uh, the blood alcohol content. With drugs or marijuana, there's no instrument, there's no medium for that. So the training and basically the observations that are made are purely from the officer in making a determination what type of influence that they're under. Makes it a little difficult. Yeah. So one other concern I've heard from people is uh, about the new developments, if that has added to calls. In, in downtown or other areas where there are new buildings coming up, if that has increased the number of calls, police calls? The, as far as the downtown buildings, very minimal, very minimal. Okay, anything else? Okay, um, I appreciate it. We should go into the other parts of the budget. I don't know if you're... So sure, I'll speak quickly yeah. on communications um, again. Personnel being the major part of the uh, communications center budget, let me first say, you know, from a pr perspective of professionalism, we probably have the best communications center in the state of Massachusetts, if not New England. And I think, you know, they need to be recognized by that. We tell them frequently, but it's nice for them to hear that um, from other individuals as well. That being said, um, as far as staffing levels, again, 97% of their budget is personnel. Um, most of which comes from the town. However, we do receive grant funding and we get um, EOPS 911 grant monies um, annually. We have one grant that's a little over 80, and you have this information, 84,000. That pays for a full-time position with benefits and it also supplements our overtime budget in the communication center. Uh, we have a supplemental, which is relatively new, budget item through the 9-11 um, cell phone reimbursement. So when 9-11 calls come in, uh, we handle those and now it's switching over to texting. We get money from the state for handling those calls as well. The money is used to also to supplement the overtime budget. The, um, the overtime budget, budgeted part of it is not, is handled mostly through the grants. So that's how we pay for our overtime uh, in the communication center and then Finally, the $12,300 annual training um, grant is uh, the money that is used. Each, each dispatcher needs to go to a certain amount of hours of training annually uh, for EMD, emergency medical dispatch, for CPR, um, conflict of interest training, that sort of thing, and that grant pays for all of the training. It's 36 hours of yeah, training they receive annually. So. Um, from a perspective of um, everything else, again, update on the objectives. They've accomplished just about everything we had um, lined up for them. Again, the switch over to handling of E911 cell phone calls directly to the communication center is ongoing, but they're doing a fine job with that. The next thing up is you're going to be able to text the 911 center if you have a call or a request for emergency services. Um, we'll see how that plays out, but we will be receiving additional funding for handling those calls as well. It's based on geographical locations in area. Um, again, that's relatively new, so we don't know quite where that's going to take us, but um, it is an area that um, is going to impact the communication center. There's no question about that. Um, again, we're one of the regional hazmat uh, response or dispatch centers, so we handle everything. Um, Chief Nelson would know the geography a little bit better than I do, but I think it's Worcester and everything. West, is that right, Tim? 
Entire state, all right. All right, thanks. So, so for the entire state, except for uh, backups and those types of things, there are two centers that handle that, Amherst being one of them. Um, I think that's it in a nutshell. Questions? Well, I have one, and then I'll see if my colleagues have anything. And I was just curious when I was reading through the book and reading the mission statement for the communication center, which has the last sentence, this expectation of excellence extends beyond the Amherst borders to neighbors in Pelham, and Leverett, and Shutesbury. And I was wondering um, how, since we don't have regional dispatch, we are interacting with those other three communities as far as the dispatch service, where that, where that correlation lies, and uh, whether there's any hope for real regional dispatch. So there's lots of hope for regional dispatch, and we've been having this conversation for, I think, 20 years. Um, when it comes to regional overall police dispatch, we've had no luck at finding partners. Um, fire services and EMS, we dispatch and, and make calls for the um, area fire departments. So that's where the regional part of that fits in. But when it comes to just um, police dispatch, um, not so much luck. How, how does that fit in with our higher ed institutions? Are you also the dispatch center for them? We are not. So UMass has their own dispatch center, Amherst College has their own dispatch center, and Hampshire College has their own dispatch center. And uh, this is the obvious question that um, Chief Nelson might be the better one to answer, which is how the flow works when a call comes in for EMS services from um, something on campus. That's the one place I think there's some. I could answer it. Uh, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait for Chief Nelson to, to answer that. But. Um, any further questions on Communications Center? Great. And then last but not least, uh, animal welfare. Um, is there anybody in this room who doesn't know Carol Hepburn? Um, again, Carol does an outstanding job. Uh, she is our sole full-time animal welfare um, officer who handles everything. Um, what people probably don't realize is how much time she spends doing investigations with either dog bites or animal complaints specific to people walking dogs off leash where they shouldn't be. Um, you know, she's a 40-hour employee who probably works 80 hours a week, even though we tell her not to. She deals with dog, dropping, dog droppings in parks all the way to dog bites. She in, in, inspects all the farms in town, makes sure people have what they say they have. That if you have a cow farm and you have 20 cows, you're not supposed to have 40. She checks that, actually goes and inspects and counts. So um, she works right out of the police facility. She's extremely popular in our building, and I don't know what else to say about Carol. Well, I, I, I think Carol's great, of course, and uh, last, last August uh, had a severe dog bite situation, ended up at Cooley Dick, and uh, Carol was on it the very next morning, and I appreciated her promptness. Yeah, she's outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she has uh, chased my chickens back to their coop and given me <laughs> lectures, <laughs> but likes our setup, so she's been wonderful, actually. Yeah, she's fabulous. She's uh, very active in the regional dog shelter now, as you know, um, and I know that's in your packet. Um, we contract with uh, Northampton and with Hadley as well. She's looking for additional partners. Um, you know, she, I mean, she does it all, so. This is really a question, I think, for the town manager, but if we have a serious violation with a pet, to the point that they have to be euthanized. Who makes that decision? I hope it's the town council because those are. <laughs> I was tree, afraid you were going to say <laughs> tree, trees and dogs are the two most controversial decisions that you will ever have. To yes, make. I have been told that by a close member of the family. Thank so you. yes, Carol would present evidence in a case like that, and the town council would be the. Re 
judge, jury, and executioners. Yes, sorry, I have sorry. to. I have to say that I thought that I had escaped it when I served my term on the select board for all those years and never had a dog hearing and then find out that I didn't escape it at all. Uh, questions? Uh, and I don't think there's, unless you have something to say about the facility, um, I know that um, we are going to have to be thinking about it on a continuous basis. We talked about it this year. As far as um, pre preparation for roof work that needs to be done. Yes. And uh, it is just a building that um, gets 24 seven use and is not as young as it was when it was built. Um, and uh, so it, it is a capital certainly issue operationally I know you um, yeah I mean operationally and the facility itself is in really really great um, condition um, you know it's got one full-time employee who actually is with the maintenance department and um, other than that the officers themselves do a great job keeping the building itself clean and stuff but yes there are areas that will need to be addressed uh, the boilers were just recently um, replaced the original boiler, so 30 some odd years. So there'll be some savings coming down the pike for heating and cooling. Um, again, the roof um, does need to be replaced, and I had requested, after many, many years of being questioned about my electric bill, why don't we have solar? Because the heat is unbearable sometimes on the south side of that building where the sun shines. So, I mean, it would make sense that we look at ways of um, getting solar installed on the roof line once it's replaced. So, Just um, on building on that, I, I saw the electrical bill line in yes. terms of dollars. So at the point the roof discussion comes, it would be useful to have the, those numbers because it's half million dollars on electrical bills. So it's, yeah. it's an offset for what we might have to invest uh, to offset this more than a half million dollars. You know, we're up to 700,000 on this by Yes, I mean, Deb Cormier is our, our head maintenance person, and she's fabulous and does a great job. Um, and we've done everything in that facility that we can kind of do as far as light bulb changes and using everything that's uh, efficient, you know, switches that turn off after you haven't been in the room for a minute or two. So all of those things have been done, and now it's just a matter of trying to find a better way to reduce cost. Okay. I guess that for, for my colleagues who are new to this, since I have been had been previously on the Finance Committee and have been involved in these discussions, I know that um, your staff has to think hard and be very careful about um, health and safety issues for themselves and for the p others using the facilities because of uh, um, health risks that come from having to hold prisoners for a period of time. And um, it is not just cleaning a building is normally cleaning a building that there's a lot more to it than I think I realized until I heard that presentation in a previous finance committee role. Um, so if there's nothing else, um, I really appreciate it. But thank you all for and thank all of the um, officers for all they do for us every day. We, um, on behalf of the community, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, yes. uh, we'd like the Chief Nelson has accommodated Steve Connor, our Veteran Services Officer, who will make a brief presentation now, so he has okay. another appointment if that's okay with you. That's fine. If that's, that's uh, page 102, no 104, 102 to 104 on your in your book. Okay, which it takes us to, into a little bit of community services, but it really breaks into yeah. various things. Uh, I apologize. Thank you. I have to be somewhere at, at 325. So, so uh, you can actually, it might begin with a 60-second uh, commercial about um, the regional program that we worked so hard and so successfully to set up and how that has benefited in your observations, town of Amherst. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so back in fiscal year 2009, I believe, is when we created a district of 
for veteran services. Our original district included the towns of Pelham, Amherst, Northampton, Williamsburg, Chesterfield, and Cummington. Oh, wow, I still remember it. Uh, since yeah. then, we have added five additional towns of Hadley, uh, no problem, Hadley, um, Chester, Middlefield, Worthington, and Goshen. So we have a little bit, about half of all of Hampshire County and one, one town in Hamden County. And the reason behind doing a district is it's a very particular type of operation that we go to training two to three times a year to keep up on all the changes. What we provide beyond doing filing for the VA, for service-connected disabilities, or the pension, or getting seniors aid and attendance money, that's through the VA, but we also offer a program through the state under Mass General Law Chapter 115. And under that law, we provide financial assistance to both veterans and their surviving spouses who are on fixed incomes, disabled, or in some cases just coming home and transitioning or out of work. And so what we need to do is provide financial assistance. We do that. We go through the state of Boston main office and tell them why we're doing it. All the documents we have that say, according to the laws and regulations, we can do this. And they give us a thumbs up. And next year, send us back 75% of that money. The one exception is, is when we ever have to deal with somebody who is homeless, whether here in Northampton, Amherst, Hadley, that we get 100% back. So if somebody's at Craig's place, which has happened, we have assisted them, that comes back at 100%. But everything else is back at 75%. Regulations and the rules change all the time. So by us managing it for all these communities, it saves the town money rather than having every single town send somebody to training all the time. We do it as a unit, we go to the training, and we come back and provide that service. Since we have taken over, I think there's been twice out of all the times that we have not gotten our 75 or 100% back um, according to regulations, and it's minimal amounts of money. So that is what we provide for the town of Amherst, and we're also involved with the American Legion and VFW for both Memorial Day Veterans Day or any other kind of patriotic ceremony um, event that we're having in the community. So that's kind of the gist of our job. Um, as well as, and I should say, also under um, veteran services, there's a lot of tax abatements that citizens who have a service-connected disability are eligible for or Gold Star families are eligible for, for both excise tax and property taxes. There also is the Veterans Tax Write-Off Program. So you know that there's a Senior Tax Write-Off Program. The Veteran also has a program that we assist with here in town. And that one is not income-based. That's just, are you a Massachusetts veteran or not? And if you are, you could do this. So that's kind of the gist of what you get from our office uh, on a weekly basis, daily basis, annual basis. So uh, just so uh, it's obvious to everybody, when you look at the budget numbers page on 104, it's divided into operating expenses and veterans' benefits, which is the much larger number um, in comparison. And uh, the operating expenses is really um, largely, but not entirely, our share of um, the regional approach, which I think has been one of the great successes of regionalization. And um, I think, Steve, you worked for Northampton at the time we started this. Right, and right. So you've been at it for a while. And, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I just got over the 15-year mark that I've been doing this. I'm and now considered the wise old man in the, in the department around the state. And I, I kind of went, well, wait a second, I'm the new outsider. No, I'm, no, it doesn't work that way anymore. No, not after 15 years. So, 
uh, questions from others. Yes. How do veterans find you if it's, you know, if it's not someone you've already been working with? That's a really good question. So um, you'll see in my narrative, that's, that's a big mission we have going forward this coming year is back when we started, when we had six towns, I was able to go to Ann Whalen House and do a presentation. I was able to go to certain places and talk to folks, just like I had done in Northampton. And we found a lot of people through that because they would then say, oh, well, such and such, her husband was a World War II vet. Or we'd go to the VFW and the American Legion and drop off materials. And we, we now run um, about 300 clients district-wide, which is, is a lot. Uh, Northampton alone, because of the VA hospital, we have the largest um, caseload per capita in the state, um, just in the city of Northampton. So it got really big and everything was doing well and now our numbers are going down and I don't know how much of it is the World War II generation and their spouses passing on and waiting to see what happens with the Vietnam veterans or how much it is just there are less veterans and less uh, family members in need. However, I'm not gonna know that until I do another push, and so that's my objective starting this summer is to go back to some of the same places, go to the library, make sure I have materials at the Council on Aging. All those opportunities to let people know what we do and what we can do for them to see if I can bring our numbers back up. Because uh, I, I really feel like they should be, but I don't know that until I really make a push again. But it is, we have the materials. We also have a little extra money in our budget, so we're gonna buy some um, marketing stuff, you know, little stuff that just has our name and number on it and the outreach and how to get to us. So um, that's my intention this coming year. Lynn? Who do you work for now? So who I work for is a board. Right. So there's representatives from every single town that meet twice a year to go over what we're doing, what my staffing levels are, and what our budget is. Yeah. So um, that's kind of who I work for. It's all through a contract that gets paid into the city of Northampton, and then Northampton mm -hmm. sends me the, um, you know, uh, pays our expenses through that account, so it's contractual. But it really is I work for all 11 communities, and if I don't do something right, I hear it. So. Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much. We appreciate thank it and glad we could work out the timing. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, thank you for all you do. Chief Nelson, we, I guess. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, uh, so uh, for me, uh, us, uh, you introduce yourself. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Lindsey Stromgren, Assistant Fire Chief. Jeff Olmstead, Assistant Fire Chief. I'm the guy that they tell what to do. So, oh. <laughs> you work for them. Pretty much, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Glad, glad I got the order of the chart right. <laughs> I just, yeah, they just kind of point, 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 point me in the right direction. Uh, for us, we're, I'm just going to hit, hit the, you know, our, you know, some, 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 some of our high highlights, uh, some change, changes that we we've, we've had, and then uh, some of the, some of the challenges, the challenges that we're looking at for the next the next year and uh, the coming coming year. And uh, then, then just kind of dive, dive. Then we can just dive, dive, dive into our budget. Just a couple of high, high, high lights this year. We're doing. We're still. Do, we've still done well with uh, grant grant ac 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 acquisition. We've uh, uh, most most of them are uh, emergency man management grants. Uh, we've got, got gotten. We've been been able to acquire radios, uh, gen gen generators. 
you know, without outfitted our CERT, CERT group with, with, with equipment and tra training. And then uh, we've uh, been, been, been able to out, out, outfit our, our, our rev, rev, rescue ta task force, which is a new, new thing la last year, with um, equi equipment, protective, protective equi equipment. Um, and this last piece is sort of, sort of a, a high, 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 highlight and a challenge, challenge, challenge. Just through, I guess, I guess you'd say bad, bad luck. Uh, <laughs> Since uh, Feb, 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 February 1st till, till now, we've had about 25% of our line, line staff has been out for you know, Ill, 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 illness, inj in, in, injury, sur surgery, that, 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 that type of thing. So it's been a long, long term ish, ish, issue. So that's, as I said, it's about 25% of our staff. Our line, 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 line staff, which is a big, big chunk, chunk, chunk for us. So we've been challenged in trying to, you know, maintain, maintain our shift, shift low levels and that, that type, type of thing. But on the highlight side, side of it, the staff has stepped, step, step, stepped up. We're working a lot, a lot about ex, uh, additional hours. Come, come, uh, you know, work, 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 working a lot. Step, stepping up. Come, coming in early, early, early stay, staying late. Pick, picking up days here, here, here and there. It takes, it's, it's taken, it's taken its uh, toll. But at the same time, I, I see that as a, as a net, net plus for uh, just how dedicated our, our staff, staff, staff is. So, um, the big change, change, changes that that we're we're seeing, uh, we're we've, we've we've got two vacant positions that we're that we're in the process of filling right right now. One one was a uh, retired retirement. One one was the uh, resignation. Uh, uh, we've added, uh, but there's been a, a move of seven about seven seven thousand dollars to to our uh, op, op, operating but. but but it's small cap capital. It came came from small cap capital items, and that's and that's gone gone. So we can for the main maintenance and up and up upkeep of our of, of our build, build buildings or our two two build buildings, which runs into our our challenge 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 piece piece again. But um, and I'll, I'll talk talk about that in just a second. And the other piece is just our, our budget in in in, in the Greece side is has come 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 about because we we just has settled a con 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 contract with the bar bar bargaining unit so there's there's those those attend, attendant ri uh, rise in, in the uh, in in, the, in our bu bu budget due to to that so big challenge 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 uh, come in the coming come, come year I just alluded to our staff uh, staffing issue issue right right now that's that that's an, an acute issue but of course but then there's our chronic piece about our staff staffing well levels being where 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 they are in light of of our um, in 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 our stead steadily in increasing activity uh, over I'd, you know, over the last 20 to 25 five, five years so and just try, trying to keep keep up with our ba baseline responsibilities becomes increasingly more di 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 difficult so uh, and as, as um, and uh, it may it may come come up but you know we, we lost uh, the ambulance con contract with Hadley last 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 year so we so we've lost some some lost uh, some some of that activity I think as, as we've shown in, in the past our growth our activity Activity growth has been within the town, the town, the town, town of Amherst. Uh, the other three, 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 three towns and the uh, the three, three, uh, the three, three schools grow at a very small, small, small rate. That they almost stay static, stat, 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 static. But the the main, the main growth has been here, here, here in town. So that's that's uh, one. Uh, the other thing is, uh, of course, main, maintain, maintain, maintaining our build, buildings. Uh, since Central is uh, 19, 20, 20, 29, and North State Station was built in 1975. So the up the up even maintenance 
those those buildings are are at, are, are becoming cre 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 increasingly expensive, 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 expensive. and on, and on on top top of that, um, our our staff, our, our on duty staff, are the ones that uh, take, they pre pre pretty much do all 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 the cleaning, the maintenance, minor maintenance, and up and upkeep of the building. That's an additional duty. So we we do all all our own stuff. You know, it's a, it's on on us. I mean, we live live live, live there, so that's a, that's a fun function of that. So uh, the the other thing is the uh, we have a uh, a ladder truck. Uh, it's, it's third, 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 thirty year, 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 years old, which is beyond nationally accepted, accepted stand, 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 standard for that type, type, type of vehicle. We did did some re rehab work on 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 it through capital expense uh, about five years, five, five years ago, oh, about five 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 years 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 ago, but. It's still a 30-year-old truck. Any parts parts we need need for it have have have, have to be fab, 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 fabricated. They really don't build the, this 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 type of type of uh, ladder, ladder, ladder truck uh, and, uh, anymore. Uh, you know, and uh, we've you know we've 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 got to, got some concerns because uh, it's it's been pushed pushed push, pushed out out a year. So we've we've got got some uh, expense, expenses that are going to come come up this this this, this year. Gen, 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 the generator that we we were hold, hold, holding off off on pen, pending what uh, what 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 we we would re receive in capital, and plus there's a breathing breathing air system that needs 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 to be uh, uh, inspected and 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 main main maintained. So that's another that that that'll bring some pressure uh, on us this this uh, in, in the coming year. So, and you know again uh, as a function of of its age. Uh, we we get the uh, the aerial inspected every, every year. It's a 30-year ladder, and we do the best best we can to you know maintain 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 it. But we're crossing our fingers this year when it comes up for 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 the inspections. So, so uh, with that, I think that that's sort of you know quick quick over, 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 overview. So we'll walk many questions you might might have. Um, I guess I did have one question to start with to follow up on something one of the many things that you reported on, um, and that had gets back to Hadley, mm -hmm. um, and I noticed in your statistics page, which is page fifty eight in the. Um, budget book uh, under EMS calls, of course, it ends with 18 um, in the report, and it's really, I think, 19 that's the first year affected by the Hadley change in service. Right. We, um, uh, have we you, left, do go. you have any initial information or observations about how much it's affected the number of calls that we sure. handle overall? Sure. Uh, we uh, had we stopped sort of serving had 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 Hadley as their prim, 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 primary provider on J July first of last last year. So uh, what what I did I asked one one of our uh, folks just hey can you check check and see what what the change 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 has been. So from here it is. Yeah. So from uh, so what what I did was compare. Uh, the year, the year per, per, prior, uh, July, July one says 17 to April, April 3rd, 30th of last last year, and then compared compared that to, uh, 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 and then while well, this this uh, the same thing period period this 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 year of course we, we didn't didn't respond there except for mutual aid or something something like like, like that, but I also I also took the, took our total total to, 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 total calls. For those same two peer, 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 periods, so uh, July one says says seventeen to April of eight, 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 18, We went to Hadley eight hundred hundred twenty two times. All right, uh, and you got that. <laughs> now our total 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 calls for that that peer, period uh, were four thousand four hundred hundred six sixty nine. 
uh, total total calls for from July of last last year to April April of this year was uh, 3707. Uh, you know, you, you would think that we would have dropped by you know 800 to 22 calls, but that that's uh, actually actually there's there's a six, 62 call to, to, to the difference, meaning more more calls that we picked pick, pick, picked up. So. And our um, our activity level level when we lost had 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 we we figured out that it would uh, that would mirror 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 what what it was in 2013, and that it would take us about five five years to get back where 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 we were just by growth. Uh, looking at at these in the last couple 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 couple, 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 couple of days, it'll probably take 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 us about three years. To get to get to get to get back, it's just that's just 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 the growth the growth we have here 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 in town. So, and how's that um, affected the operations side? Has it um, alleviated some of the stress or not? <laughs> well, this, it's kind of tough because you know it, uh, we're keep, keeping our head head above above, above wall, 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 water, but then it's and then I guess you got to. Contrast well. How how high is is the wall water? It it has relieved some of the, some of the, some 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 of the, some of the stress. Well, it has true, but we're still we're still getting getting to, to the point where 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 we're going to meet meet uh, make cr cr critical mass hit hit, hit that cr 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 critical point. We're really close 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 to that because the growth the growth 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 is still still there. So you want, you want to address address, address that? Then? Yeah, I just want to follow up. If uh, I said to you our average EMS call volume was say 17 calls a day, and then after Hadley it dropped to 14 and a half or 15 over a period of 24 hours, that doesn't necessarily translate into a great big relief. Um, it still means a group of folks who are doing a high volume of calls, uh, made worse unfortunately by the the surgeries and the injuries that occurred over this winter, um, and the likelihood is we'll be right back in the same boat in a couple of years. This is our opportunity, hopefully, to try to make some kind of change. You know, we've tried to educate and tried to provide information, um, but we could really use some help. Yeah. I'm going to um, call my colleagues. Before I do it, I just wanted to add one thing from um, select, uh, Chief, you presented uh, to the select board when we still had a select board, and I was still a member of it, um, about um, the fire staffing study. And one of the observations that I wanted to just share with my colleagues, because I had heard this at that time and I thought it was significant, is that um, a big growth and pressure factor on um, our uh, service is actually calls for elders. Mm -hmm. And it's an age-related thing. And it is not uh, the university driving the stress. That's true. That's true. And uh, I just wanted to share that. So, uh, Kathy. That's a, that's a perfect lead into my question. Um, when I look at, and I'm not sure which of the lines, whether it's total EMS calls, which are up uh, about 1,000 over the time period you've given us, advanced life support, which is flat, or patient contacts, no transport, you know, the, the categories you've got them in. Do you have an estimate of how much of that is specifically the elderly or the big uh, service centers like Applewood and the Arbors? And I don't need the number right now. Um, no, well, we have, sort of a, have, as, that. We have, have, okay. have, we have, have those, those figures. We, we've, we've got kind of dived, 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 dived down, into, into, into okay, those. and then my follow-up, do they, do people get charged for that ambulance call? Is there a fee? Sure. Yes. 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 Why don't you talk about the, uh, the, dem the, dem the demographic? So demographics, if you look back at the presentation we had done for the council, we had a very specific chart we can share with you again um, at any time, and hopefully that's on our website. Um, and that had an age demographic on it. Um, and so it was very interesting to see, despite the fact we've seen the increased growth, particularly University of Massachusetts, over the last 10, 15 years, there's a slight growth that comes with that, but the real dramatic growth was in our over 60 population and the level of needs that that group uh, requires over time. And as that group has gotten bigger, we've done more and more calls. So 
uh, there's a strong correlation between the age and, and the And we do collect when, when an ambulance goes out, even if it doesn't carry them to the hospital? Do, is there a charge for? No, I want to separate those for you. Okay. Um, so if we transport somebody to the hospital, we do charge a bill. If we don't transport somebody to, um, to the hospital, and what we get is we call the refusal of treatment or uh, a no trip, then we don't actually charge for that. So we are finding we are doing a high volume of what we call lift assist, where someone, say, at the Arbor's Falls, and they're not sure if they're hurt or not. Um, they may even say they're not hurt. They just need help getting up. Uh, we've seen a shift there where the staff used to help pick people up, and now they don't, and they call us to come down and help them lift them up and evaluate them and see if they want to go to the hospital. That is a sort of private apartment-style residence with uh, assisted living oversight. Um, so that means just like if I spoke to any one of you as if it was your domicile, um, if you would fall in and we talk to you and ask you if you'd like to go to the hospital, we would be happy to take you to the hospital. And you may say, no, I feel okay. I just needed help getting from the ground up. I slipped when I got out of bed, um, those type of things. And we're doing a lot of those right now. Um, at that residence. I, think I just want to stay with this a little bit. I mean, my, my background was in some nursing home health care, but sure. if an assisted living, I always thought, would do that, that they had staff <laughs> capable because the people who are in it are paying for that extra. They used to. Yeah, they so this, this sounds area. like it's shifting it to a municipal budget when it should be coming out of a, a facility budget? There's a work shifting, a work load shifting that's occurred. And I think really when you talk to them, it would come down to liabilities. So picking people up, people are heavy. There's potential for sure. injury. Yeah. You're very familiar with this work in your background. Um, and so they've shifted that burden to the municipal, in this case, fire department to provide them. There are a fair number of folks that will fall that do have some level of injury. Um, we're just trying to find that balance where we could work with them to figure out more of the people who need transport and care versus the people who just need to help up. But so if the staff were trained, so a skilled nursing home is trained to lift and, and know how to move someone, because um, it's, it's both a danger to the person on, who's fallen, but also the person who's trying to lift them um, without training. So if these facilities had trained staff, it would be a relief to your budget. So that's an interesting balance between the regulatory side of um, assisted living versus um, a nursing home format. Okay. So there's some opportunities there that hopefully we can improve on. We've tried to meet with them to work on those. There may be need for additional assistance trying to create that communication and get things done, because right now I've been unsuccessful in creating any significant change there. Okay. Thank you. Lynn, Lynn. Very much along the same lines. Thank you. And, and uh, for us, it's, it's, a case, it's also a case, case of trying to get, get them to do, you know, to, to assist, 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 assist their, their clients because if, if, if we go, go for a lift, lift assist and it remains just, just, just that, then we've taken, taken, taken an ambulance and its crew out of, out of service, service, service for a particular Amount, 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 amount of time when we believe that the staff there is would, would is very well suited to uh, do to do the lift and do an assess, 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 assessment so that I mean the ultimate the ultimate goal is get get to the point where when when they call us it's because they need a tran, 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 transport they, they they need need that pre pre hospital care not just to pick them up off the floor and back back back, back in bed. So it's not, I just want to follow up, there are, they have a dementia unit. So there are patients there that are very difficult to assess because of the dementia. So there's a certain number of patients there that when they fall, we have a high suspicion that we need to take them to hospital. So even working out some of these protocols or trying to engage with them more doesn't give us 100%, you know, change because certain type of patients that they have there that it will always be challenging. Um, but I think there's room there and we're trying to find that room to, to make this a better situation that we have. Shall we? Maybe taking a similar idea now to a different context of fire, could we identify what are the main causes of fire? For example, is it uh, the building's not up to the fire codes, or is it more related to accidents? Can, we, can you identify what the causes are? 
Fire, generally, you know, the big, biggest cause, cause, cause of fires here and across, across the board is co co cooking, uh, uh, cook, uh, cooking accident, accident. Not, not, pay, you know, be either not, not pay, 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 paying attention, attention that, uh, that type, type, type of thing. Cook, 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 cooking is the lead, leading cause of, 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 of fire. Cooking, and then uh, smoking has become, you know, more pre prevalent as we see the changes. Certainly, in the off-campus college-age students, cover detectors are a big problem for us. Uh, we've engaged in a, a number of activities uh, related to off-campus housing and on-campus housing, and engaged with the dean of students to try to get some assistance with cover detectors. We find there, and that's been successful. Uh, we're working on that. We've done off-campus work in both fraternities, sororities, and some of the other off-campus facilities. Uh, we work doing community outreach with Officer Laramie and John Thompson from Inspection Services. In that process, I'm very involved in that, and we do work on some public education, particularly within that group. So we're trying to expand our access into the younger groups of oncoming students at UMass, and we're hoping to see how they maybe change their orientation and get in there at an earlier stage. And I hope we're making progress on stopping students from disconnecting smoke detectors. Yeah. That's actually a big problem. I, I, oh, sure it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do they get fined if you find that they didn't have, they removed the There can the be a, pro, a criminal process and a, a, even a non-criminal process that we use. We're actually looking and hoping as the council gets um, their feet underneath them. There's a, a draft bylaw out there to look at some covered detectors within the community and make it a similar bylaw find to what you see for open burning. So when that comes across the uh, council's uh, opportunity, that would be great. Other questions? And, um, this is a group I know well. <laughs> uh, I guess the only other thing that I was going to ask you and then I have one question for the town manager. Um, I noticed that you're doing a lot of recruitment on call fire, the call force, and um, I was wondering if we've had a turnover or what, what, what happened there and how does that affect our, us budgetarily is, is, if well, we're not successful? Well, so the assistant chief, chief strong, 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 and then trying to charge the call force and a former call force member, so I think he'd, he'd be the best, best to answer that. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, as most people probably know, but I'll summarize just so everybody does know, um, we do have three forces in town, our full-time firefighter paramedics that are on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing the majority of our daily calls. Um, we also have a student volunteer force, which runs out of the North Station, uh, approximately two dozen to 30 UMass students. They're volunteer, they're not paid, um, and they actually staff an engine company during the academic year. Uh, every night, seven days a week, 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. and 24 hours a day on weekends. So they're an additional engine company that we are using more and more as our full-time staff get tied up on calls. They're running medical calls in the engine. Uh, EFR is waiting for an ambulance to respond. They're doing alarms to campus, things like that. And we actually recruit for them twice a year to keep their numbers up because the nature of the group is, unfortunately, they graduate and go on to do other things. So uh, we are recruiting constantly for them. The call force is a little bit different. Uh, they are uh, part-time firefighters. They are paid. They are typically townspeople, either people that live in town and or work in town. And they are called in to do station coverage when the full-time firefighters are tied up during those times when the students are not in quarters. So that would be uh, daytimes throughout the year and also nights and weekends during the summer and intercession. And everybody in the department, both all groups are called in if we have a working uh, building fire. So the call force, we start, try to keep staffed about 20 up to a maximum strength of 24. Uh, unlike our full-time people, we do not do a one-for-one -one hiring. So in other words, when we have a vacancy for the full-time uh, force, as we do now, we have two vacancies, we'll go out and recruit and interview and hire to fill those vacancies. We keep those full all the time for obvious reasons. The call force, because of the nature of the training, we're typically hiring people that have no fire background. Occasionally we're lucky and we find somebody, but typically it's somebody with no training. So the training program is fairly intensive. It takes three to six months to train somebody new to be a call firefighter before they can be of service to us. So we will actually let those numbers go down one by one until we reach a threshold and then we'll do a singular big hiring 
a singular training class and get the numbers back up again. So to answer your question, we're at that point now where due to attrition, people moving on to other things, uh, moving out of town, uh, we're now down quite low. So we need to actually take on about eight or so, eight, maybe even as many as 10 call firefighters to bring our numbers back up to the 20 to 24 mark. Then we plan to run that training class this summer once we hire those individuals. We're actively recruiting now the deadline for applications, if anybody's interested, is uh, May 31st, and no experience is necessary. I'm not interested, thank you. Um, <laughs> however, I, this might be a question both for the fire, but also it would have been for police, and that is once we have uh, footed the bill, if you will, for somebody to either be trained to, for EMS, fire and or police, what is our, the contractual relationship in terms of how long they must stay with the town after that? There, actually, there's nothing, nothing to keep, keep them from leaving after that. Uh, after, the, after they've been, been after, after we've trained, trained, tra trained them, out, outfitted fit, fitted them and all that, that type of thing. There's nothing, nothing to, uh, that if they, if they want, 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 want to leave, then they, then they leave. There's nothing contractual to keep, keep, keep them. Is that true also for uh, police? Hi. Thank you. I, I, I would just add that in having been part of the interview process for all groups, uh, the students, the call in full time, it's one of the big things we try to ferret out from people as to what do they see their life plans being. You know, in the terms of it, uh, case of full-time firefighters, we want them to be committing to a 30-year career here. So that's one thing we're looking for. Um, Collins students, it's more the time commitment. We know they're only going to be here for three years. Um, we just want to make sure they're going to be able to give us the time we need because it's pretty intensive. Call firefighters, it's a huge part. We would like a call firefighter to be committing to 10, 20 plus years, as many have, as they you know, live and work here in the community. So again, it's something we try to get to as part of the interview process because with not looking for experience. What we are looking for is commitment and hopefully longevity. Follow up real quick. The majority of folks that we're looking for that will score higher in our process will likely be paramedics and have some experience as paramedics already. So majority of our training with those new hires on the career side will be at the fire academy. And I just want want to add about this, especially about the call 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 force. It gets it, it gets tough tough to recruit recruit folks because they're they're do do doing this in addition to their full 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 time jobs, and a lot of a lot of time they have have to have a commitment from their full full time empl employer to allow them to leave during the, during the day, you know, to come come to come come and and uh, and, and serve serve their community. And I think across the board. You'll find that call, our call call force per personnel. You know they're not do, do do doing this to get to get 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 rich. It's because they care about about their community. They want to give back to their community. And and the the degree of commit commit commitment, the great degree of commit commit commitment, is inherent inherent with that with, with that with that uh, that val 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 value system. You know they they really want to be part part of this. They really want to. Give give back 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 to the, the community. So we have folks that have been been, been there for, for years and years and years, and that's and that's the kind of kind. And but it's it's, it's still get, get it's getting tough, tougher to recruit recruit folks because, you know the, the way the way the way 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 the world world is now. You know some some employers are less are a little reluctant to allow their folks to you know to leave because they're 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 in business. So. you no, I, I just, building on Lynn's question, I just, do you have any sense there is actually an issue of people coming, some percent coming and getting the training and then leaving, you know, so the hope is 10 to 20 years. Is it rare that people leave, you know, the emergency in the family, something happens, you're moving out of the area, but do most stay? Yeah, yes, yeah, so, yeah, this is, we're di different, I guess. This is, is what I what I like 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 mm -hmm. like, like to, to say. Would uh, you do this job because you care, yeah. and because you're committed to it, and you want to make make a, 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 a difference? And it's been rare. I mean, I've 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 I've, I've, I've been here 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 for a period, period of time. I've worked worked in the whole Holyoke fire fire for 20, 20, 28 years, 
And in both play, play, places, it's been a case of extremely rare that some, someone comes for a short, short time and then just says, I'm out of here. And, and some, sometimes it's a case of, you know, folks find, re, re, realize that, you know, this is just not for me. And, that, that's, and, that's, and that's okay. And some, some folks come and it's just, you know, it's a ste 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 stepping stone. But I found, found it rare. I mean, it, ha it happens, but it's been rare here. My question for uh, the town manager uh, gets to, uh, so you can get to the right place on the bottom of page 59 in the box um, on significant budget changes. Um, I thought I, I think I heard um, the chief say that there's a contract settlement and uh, with one of the uh, bargaining units. And so um, what your statement there indicates is that um, Personnel services um, does not include cost of living increases for contracts not currently negotiated. Is that? That's a true statement. There are some non-union employees in there that work at the um, fire station. All the fire contract has been settled for this year, but not all the contracts. So there's nothing in the, uh, nothing that's placed in the general fund for uh, salary reserve that hasn't been transferred, that isn't already transferred in the way you've written the budget? No. There's a, um, most of the contracts are not settled and are sitting in the general fund budget. The only contract that was settled for fiscal year 20, actually for this year, including 20, is the fire contract. But they have civilian employees that are not yeah. settled. So, okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure that um, there would be no changes between now and when we adopt the budget. It'll be really slight, but it won't be a change here. It'll just be okay. moved out once the contracts are all settled. Thank you. Um, other questions? Hi. Uh, Pat. Yes. I want to thank you for the support you've given the sanctuary at First Church. Um, and particularly for your willingness to support us in the appeal process in Boston. Thank you very much. No problem. And uh, thank you. And please convey our appreciation to the entire force for all that you do for the community. Thank you. Thank you. So, Paul, do you? LSOC will be next. Barbara. And joining me today is Donna Roy, who is our operations manager. So um, let's start with the leisure services budget, the LSSC budget, uh, highlights, changes, challenges. Uh, we'll start with the reduction. We've, uh, we've recently reorganized the department staffing, which resulted in a close to a 5% uh, reduction in the, um, in the budget. Uh, so we're doing that to uh, we did that really just to enhance our operational efficiency, and uh, up to this date, it's worked um, very, very well. Let's see some of the the other issues. Um, we let's see are working with uh, professional design firms, uh, community volunteers, and other department staffs uh, as far as accomplishments to we finished the master plan for Groff Park and that is under construction now uh, with a completion date which is tentatively July 2019 so we're hoping to open that park relatively soon uh, weather permitting <laughs> um, let's see our challenges uh, remain um, pretty much in terms of our part-time staffing uh, just being able to keep the necessary uh, staff to participant ratios 
so that we're providing safe programs and adequately staffing our programs effectively. So uh, with the uh, continuing increase in the minimum wage, which is important, um, it still has resulted in us kind of thinking outside the box, making some adjustments, and then um, having the town step forward and also to help provide additional funding for, for instance, the pools and uh, Cherry Hill. And you'll see that in the other budgets. Uh, we've, uh, you know, some of our other accomplishments recently have been, we've redone our, completely redone the registration process, upgraded a lot of our technology, made it much more easier for people to register online, which, uh, you know, has resulted in a lot of positive feedback and uh, ease of folks getting into the programs that they're trying to um, get either get their children into or get into themselves. And we've been very happy about that. We've also done uh, multiple collaborations with different businesses, social service agencies, and educational institutes to um, provide recreational opportunities to people in our communities who might not otherwise be served uh, in terms of recreational programming. <clears throat> uh, I spoke already about the activation of Grop Park. We're really excited about that. Um, I think we'll stop. Do you have anything to add on the leisure services? No, I'm all set. All right. Do you have questions on the leisure services budget? Yes. Hello. Um, I noticed your reference to a strategic plan. Yes. And did that last year, or when was when was that? Uh, right now, we, we put it out, um, a, a request for quotes and qualifications. The amount came in higher than uh, we had anticipated, so I'm working with a procurement officer for the town uh, right now to get that out again with reduction in some of the requirements that we had addressed in that. So we hope to see that happen in the fall. And besides the, could you just talk a little bit about the use of leisure services in the Bang Center? Um, in reference to? We do youth programs there. We yep. have performing arts programs for, for children and teens. Uh, in addition to that, we have um, some other, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. We definitely have lots of adult pro dance programs. Um, let's see, just, um, there was a, just recently a writing program for children that took place there. Uh, community theater uses that as a uh, space in which they do some of their, their rehearsals and auditions and things like that. Um, not, not a lot, but uh, occasionally. Okay. Can you think of Thank anything you. else you'd like to add? Uh, Boltwood. Yes, we do run a program, that's a good one, uh, for uh, uh, special needs adults. And we do that in collaboration with UMass. It's been a long-standing relationship, very, very good program, and that happens two evenings uh, during the week uh, while, while the uh, university is in session. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Noticing the volunteer hours dropping, and can you have you identified what the reason might be, and is there anything we can do to support that? Yeah, that, that's a good question. We have seen in uh, some of our, particularly our, our special events, uh, it's been more and more difficult to rec recruit volunteers. Uh, and I think that's why that number has decreased. On the other hand, we have a great outpouring of volunteers uh, for our sports programs. So it really, it kind of depends. Uh, but at one time, we used many more volunteers for our special events, and now we are tending to rely not only on volunteers, but on um, part-time temporary staff that work in other programs that come help, for instance, in the 4th of July. Yes. Yeah, Just on uh, the volunteers or the potential to volunteer, um, is there an age limit on the lower side? You know, on a, you have to be at least this old, uh, yeah, it would probably depend on the event we use as high school students, uh, for instance, for our Halloween event. Uh, we use high school students for the 4th of July as well. Uh, I would say it's probably high school and above for and, the most part. And I'm partly asking because I yeah. was just with two middle schoolers over the mm -hmm. weekend 
who have been promoting the idea of a youth council oh, wow. to get middle schools more involved. And they're thinking about art and performance, but they both are the kind of people that could staff an event and might love to. So I, I just don't know where, when you think of where you might go sure. um, for people and, you know, if you've got them young, they might still be there with you when they're in high school or if they happen to stay here and go to UMass. You know, I'm trying to think of a pipeline of volunteers. Mm -hmm. Well, I think certainly they, they, they would need to contact either myself or uh, Stacy Laqueve, one of the program directors, and you know, we could sit down and talk, and you know, we'll, we'll take advantage of, of uh, any kind of volunteer commitment they would like to offer. And I had a, um, you know, I, I can see how tight the budget is, so it's not like, what else could you do with this money? But, um, you know, a couple of programs outside of Amherst that I've seen uh, tied uh, leisure service and some private money to after-school programs, um, particularly around skill and performance at the same time. So one creative one I saw in New York was STEM with Dance, mm -hmm. and they were using dance to teach analytic skills at the same time, um, but they weren't, use, they weren't always doing it in a school, they were sometimes doing it outside. If, would le leisure service coordinate programs like that, or would you usually leave it to let the high school, I mean, in terms of where the locus would be if, but we currently run an after-school program at Crocker Farm, and we collaborate extensively with uh, the Amherst uh, School Department, uh, depending on their needs. And then there is also a program called Achievement Academy, which uh, gives children extra help after school, which we also are linked with. So between our camps and after school, we are doing some of that and doing STEM work as part of our curriculum That's uh, that we do with those programs. We're, licensed by the state and they do have now pretty specific curriculum requirements and a lot of that is enhancement to what goes on in the classroom. It's the only reason I mentioned this one is yeah. it was attracting kids because they were coming to dance. Yeah. And when coming to dance, yeah, and they were getting something else and one or two that like STEM came because it had the STEM piece and mm -hmm. they actually discovered they loved to dance. So it was a <laughs> nice synergy of what happened sure. when people were exposed. It was pitched particularly at young women. I mean, mm -hmm. high school age, middle school age kids. Well, that sounds interesting. If you have some more information, you could just forward that to me. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Shelly, and then I'll just gonna do you offer scholarships? Do we offer scholarships for families who can't afford to pay? Yes. We have a significant, thanks to uh, town meeting, uh, as uh, we, we have almost $170,000 that uh, is available to uh, any Amherst resident um, who has need, obviously, either on free or reduced lunch, who can, and they can just basically show that use the paper and then they'll get financial assistance. We also use a portion of that money to do outreach programs at the different housing areas throughout the town and that's been extremely successful. I think the model of the big community center where everybody tries to come to you is not, doesn't work for all people. And in fact, because of all kinds of barriers, transportation, just to name one, but uh, family circumstances and so on. So we've made a commitment to do outreach, program outreach to these different um, housing areas, and it's, it's been extremely well received. And that, that program is now just continued in the budget. It goes on each year. Uh, so it was added by a town meeting several years ago, mm -hmm. and Sandy Pooler was still here, and, uh, but it's now just built into the budget. Uh, I know that you'd been working on trying to do a strategic planning process all together and kind of look at all of the programs and make uh, thoughtful um, uh, analysis of each of the programs that we run. And it seems to be from what it said when the FY19 objectives, it was labeled as rescheduled is that is it rescheduled to something definite or is it rescheduled to indefinitely out there in the future? No, it's definitely rescheduled. I mean, we did put it out already. There were three, <clears throat> excuse me, different consulting groups that responded. 
unfortunately, the number that came back was, was more than we had in our budget, and it wasn't, there just wasn't a match. So I have to reduce some of the uh, <clears throat> services I'd requested as part of that strategic plan. Okay, thank you, because I, I, I really appreciated you taking that on. One, the one question that I um, have, and then we'll move on to the other budgets, unless there's anything further that goes to, uh, I guess, to Sonia, is that um, I was a little bit confused by something on page 109 of the budget book. Uh, this can go to Paul, too, but um, you indicated that six-tenths of an FTE for the customer assistance position was moved from away from LSSC and into finance, but the chart that's a little bit higher on the page looked like FY20 is six-tenths higher, not six-tenths lower. I was a little confused by that. I guess I'm understanding your question. The top of the page, the chart at the top of the In page? In the chart at the top of the page under positions, it lists for FY19, 5.85 and 6.45 for FY20, which is six tenths increase. And then I, that's why I was just confused by I'll the have match. To go back and look at the backup and get back to you on that. Okay. Another day. Um, shall we go on to uh, pools? Municipal pools? Certainly. So we have seen a, about a 10% increase um, in uh, participants in our swim lessons from last year. And that number seems to be continually growing, which is, a, I think, a very positive thing. And I think I would just like to put out there that our ultimate goal, if we had one, was to make sure that every child in Amherst learns to swim. And uh, <clears throat> so we are working toward that uh, with, uh, we put out there that this year we'll see a 10% growth again in that number. <clears throat> We've. We also provide a number of uh, free swimming passes to the Survival Center and also to the Family Center at uh, the middle school. And those have uh, been extremely well received and utilized, so we're proud of that. At least uh, we, we, went at it, we did over 600 uh, swim passes that were distributed, and we'll continue working with those groups and probably expand that more to the, the children um, that we're working with in the program outreach as well. That's a good thing. And we're trying to get those kids also involved in swim lessons as well. Um, let's see. Changes. Well, we've talked about Groff Park, so I won't go into that again. Um, and the swim lessons, those are pretty much the major things that come to the surface. <laughs> Anyways, um, no pun intended, yeah. All right, <laughs> I think that's it for pools. Yes, question. Uh, just uh, your, your goal of having every kid learn to swim if our children age population is going down, you know, in terms of your denominator maybe lower than it used to be, which is why this isn't increasing. It's a, it's a back link to the school, you know, or elementary schools. Do you ever go in and just send a note home to your parents? Do your kids know how to swim? You know, do you do a kind of... We certainly how, do how a lot of promotion, more social media. Yeah. Uh, than we probably do with flyers now these days. We've changed our kind of, the way yeah, we're I'm just things, trying to think of a uh, note home yeah. to the parents or something. Right. It's important every kid learn not to swim, you know, click here, or just something that's more of a push mm -hmm. notification sure. rather than I have to sign up. Or... Sure. But we are doing, like I said, I, we have done promotions in the schools. We've even thought about having our aquatics coordinator, and we're trying to actually do that this spring, go out and, and talk to different groups. It's hard to come directly in the schools, they obviously have their curriculum and then their requirements that they need to do, but certainly there are other ways we can reach children directly and their parents, more importantly. 
Anything else? No. Nope. Questions? Um, yes. So you, your eagle eye has found the one mistake. We put one mistake in the budget book, and you found it. If you go to um, page XII, uh, it uh, it is correct, which is the total personnel list. So it, it we just they just transposed the, the six point four five should be an FY nineteen, and the five point eight five should be an FY twenty. So it should be a negative okay. point six. Okay. So we put that there purposely, I think. I don't know if I were you, I'd go collect that position right now. <laughs> um, uh, and I guess, look, finally, I'd just like to thank you for the increase uh, to help offset the cost of uh, the increase in minimum wage. So we did get a $10,000 increase to help with that this year. And that will be uh, definitely used and appreciated. So yes. what is the minimum wage we're paying? We're paying currently $12 an hour, and that will go to twelve seventy-five, I believe, January 1st. And this is consistent with and the state will, guidelines? Yes, and it'll go to 15 eventually. Right. Thank you. Okay. And just for the record, uh, I, I assume that uh, anything we're doing in indoor pools is actually under LSSC and not municipal Correct. pools. Okay. Um, golf course? Golf course. Um, so same uh, sort of challenges that are quite obvious. The weather has impacted Cherry Hill this year. It's just continuing from last summer. Um, we've had, had a down year um, because of the weather. And it, you, we were hoping for a dry spring to help make up some of that revenue. Although we're holding our own, and that's due, I think, to a variety of issues. Um, when we saw a, a fairly good April in terms of revenue, we're still not above where we should be right now. So that has been a continuing challenge. The, um, the other thing I think that's important is that we've worked hard to um, provide a variety of different programs and especially capitalizing on the winter programs at Cherry Hill and the um, availability and accessibility of groomed uh, cross-country ski, ski trails up there. And uh, again, very well received by the community great turnout. Sometimes you can go up there after we've had a fresh snow and the parking lot is literally filled. So it uh, means that people are using it and the community is very appreciative of it. Um, let's see. So in terms of where we're going, if what we will, what we plan to do next fiscal year is to have an advisory <clears throat> group that we'll put together a committee to really look at the operations and potential uses of Cherry Hill. So that will happen most likely again toward the end of the summer, the fall. And um, we will, that group will come up with recommendations. Uh, I know that there has been some community input. Someone came to the JCPC, an individual from the community, requesting, <clears throat> you know, uh, I think it was $300,000 for clubhouse improvements. So, um, you know, well, we'll be looking, obviously, at all of that, but trying to do it in a more directive way that uh, we'll have a planful way, I should say. Um, let's see. I think that's pretty much it. We did and then get a small increase for minimum wage, increase about $3,000, so a slight increase in the um, part-time seasonal help up there. Does the close of the golf course in South Amherst uh, have any potential for us for picking up um, play? Yes, I think we have already seen an impact. Uh, <clears throat> we picked up several. We, had, we did a promotion for new members this year for memberships. We Anyone who is a new member to the club got 20% off that membership. That seems to be very successful, fairly successful in picking up some of those members from Hickory. Um, we've seen some daily fee uh, players from Hickory, so an increase there, and uh, certainly a tournament that's forthcoming that might have happened there is now going our way. So I think we'll see more of that as we uh, go forward. Yeah, you know, I want to go back to your um, comment about the proposal that came to JCPC and understand the if there have been discussions between you and that individual uh, and kind of where you would see that going. 
Yeah. Um, he actually, uh, this individual did come with um, another council person, Kathy, uh, to our last commission meeting and gave a presentation. I think it was, everybody was in agreement. Those are all great things. The question remains where we get the funding. So, you know, and what are the priorities of the town uh, in terms of, rec you know, using those, the monies that we have, you know, for recreational dollars and uh, how would they be best spent? And in that process, I, I'm, I stood on sure. JCPC and mm -hmm. mostly it was discussed with relationship to golf, but not necessarily to skiing. I think he, uh, in this particular case, he was looking at better, if we could improve the clubhouse, for instance, let's start with insulation, and uh, bringing it up to it, to, uh, the way we heat it is probably not at all efficient. It's electric heat, it isn't efficient. Um, there's probably some things we could do for solar uh, that we could, but so that we could use it on a year-round basis and not have a huge utility bill that you know, requires us now to shut it down until we hold Winterfest. So we really shut down for four months. Does that answer? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I looked for it, so I probably, my eyes are not as sharp as Andy's, but I didn't see the, I saw the use side, I didn't see the revenue side, and I saw way up at top revenue that I think combines school and golf, so maybe, you know, in terms of revenues, but one of the ideas of the clubhouse mm -hmm. um, in relation to the golf course is that it could become a community center mm -hmm. and potentially be making enough of a margin that it subsidized reduced fees for golf, for high school, middle school, families, to think of it as an outdoor activity, not necessarily, it's golf, but you're actually walking around doing something so that you're not thinking this is gonna be, I'm gonna become a golfer. So the, uh, the person who had proposed this did talk to me and he's actually uh, probably gonna, uh, he got linked up with an architect who was gonna take a look at the building, you know, just to get an estimate of is there anything there to start with or not? Um, but the idea was bigger than, what you just said was bigger than golf. It just Correct. happens to be at a golf course and it's a year round recreation, a thing that feeds into the winter side, but also feeds into you could gather in the evening and hear music even, you know, I mean, it's thinking of it being, a, a, we don't, there's nothing in North Amherst like right. it. Yeah. No, that's, thank you, that's good, good point. Yes. Councillor Shane, Councillor Shane is uh, district includes. I'm, the I'm golf a, di course. a district one. We're always looking for <laughs> community space, and mm -hmm. because there's no place to act, but even a district one meeting, you know, the library is clearly we we can get a person in there, but we can't get 15. <laughs> you know, so sure. So it, if I missed it, I, I I can get it later. Just on revenues, golf course and revenues, the pool. I was just looking at separating those two streams. It's it's probably there, and I just didn't see it. Um, yeah. Why don't we okay. come back to that at a later point? And uh, I don't need it right now. Yeah, no, I know. Because because. Uh, Sonia can help us with that too, and with the, at a later time. And Any other questions? Okay. If there's nothing, if there's nothing else, um, looking around, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I think we should need to get to your two colleagues from yes. community services and see if we can still finish at four. Okay. It's gonna be a challenge, but appreciate all you're doing and thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. You. But, Senator so Public Health First, or is it, have, you, have, you, do you, have you guys come to an agreement? Okay. And we're at public health. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Fetterman, the health director. Uh, 
So I am going to take to heart my directions, which were to make this about five minutes to leave you time for questions. And um, I would say uh, in my budget this year, the biggest change is the six hour a week increase for the public health nurse. Um, that comes to an amount of $10,827. Uh, I can start out with that historically for many years, um, the nursing position was at 26 hours a week. So this restores it to what it was for many years. Um, One of the things that this increase in hours will do is allow us to do a lot more health education in the community. A couple of things that have been identified is the need for health education around the safe use of marijuana um, for those who are over 21, and also education with youth and families around the effects on the developing brain. So we really want to partner with the schools around this, as well as other um, venues in town. We had hoped to be working on that last year, and you can see that that um, objective was rescheduled because um, I just didn't have enough staff time between myself and Jennifer Brown, our public health nurse, to accomplish that. We also were uh, sort of in a holding pattern because the State Department of Public Health was planning to launch a statewide effort and we wanted to be uh, incorporating their messages so there really was um, consistent messaging throughout the state. That hasn't really completely um, been finished at the state level. So as we see that our first recreational facility will likely open uh, in the next week, we really want to be moving ahead with that. So that'll be one of the things that our public health nurse will be working on. Our objectives um, for FY20 are to be researching current trends in tobacco control. We've been meeting for several months now about our current tobacco regulations with the Board of Health. We are updating them to address vaping, and that will also be part of what we're working on um, in terms of education, partnering with the schools as we're seeing vaping become an epidemic um, among our youth, not just in Amherst, but really across the country. Um, I've been working with other town departments and the Board of Health for a few years now as we're looking at the siting and opening of our recreational marijuana establishments that will continue to be ongoing. We meet regularly to discuss the various aspects of what, what goes into the siting of a facility to keep it um, something that is secure and safe for the community, and then give our feedback to the town manager. Another thing I'll point out in the budget is um, we, Amherst is part of a 27 town tobacco coalition that gets grant money from the state in order to enforce our tobacco regulations. Um, last year and part of the year before, the entity that was holding that uh, grant lost their health director, so that meant that uh, compliance checks were not being done. So in FY17, there were only nine compliance checks done in Amherst. That increased, increased to 17. That will be going back up to in the 30s to 40s. That is the way that our tobacco regulations get enforced is by all these towns pooling together and hiring enforcement officers who actually go out and do um, educational checks at all of our uh, retail tobacco stores and also um, do uh, attempts to sell to the, as the, they actually contract with the state to use youth to attempt to sell. So that's how we find out if people are checking IDs.
I have a fairly small budget, so there's not a whole lot in there that's changed. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. Yeah, Lynn. Could you talk a little bit about your observation with regard to the utilization of the Musanti Center and uh, the relationship to your services? Yes, so um, I have been part of the effort to develop and open the Musanti Health Center. One of the ways that our department dovetails with them is we, we have a strong relationship at the health department with the school nurses. We also provide immunizations um, on a regular basis to folks who are newcomers to, the ta to town, don't have health insurance, have come from somewhere else, need to find a medical home. So we link people up with the Musanti Health Center. Um, what's great is it's right in our building, so if they're coming to us, either to access um, getting hooked up to health insurance or to get immunizations to get into school, we can actually walk them right downstairs. Um, and show them where the facility is. This, we also were part of promoting the health center before it opened. Now that the health center is open, they're seeing their uh, enrollment rates for patients climb, but slowly. It takes time for an entity like that to really get incorporated into the com community. So we are a bridge to that partly because I help chair the Human Service Network, um, and that is a meeting once a, month, once a month where various nonprofits get together that serve Amherst residents, and we talk about the needs that we're seeing in the community and um, how we can um, promote services to people, because it can be complex when you're especially if you are relatively new to town, to find out where to get various types of services. So um, this health center is a particularly desirable thing because it has dental care. So that's often how we're getting people to take that leap to try a new um, health care facility also. Yeah, let me go ahead. I noticed also in your uh, challenges, you mentioned mental health and homelessness, as we also were discussing with the police chief, and though we didn't discuss it with EMS and fire, I know they deal with the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it just would be useful to hear your observations on this issue. Yes, I would say that is one of the biggest challenges we face. And that's not unique to Amherst at all. It's not unique to Massachusetts. Um, we have our own um, uh, issues around this because we are moderately rural here. So the number of healthcare providers may be a little less who provide mental health services. You may have to travel further. But really, this is a problem of our, our healthcare system. So um, in terms of folks who are homeless, we see a lot of folks who have comorbidity between substance use disorder, which could be alcohol or drugs, and uh, mental health diagnoses. So on top of the fact that people who are homeless also have other medical issues, that's like a triad of really difficult problems. Um, and then on the side of folks who are housed, we see a lot of people who, while they may have housing, they are mentally ill and not, are not seeking services or are not staying on their meds. They're cyclically being hospitalized for a short stay. This is true for homeless folks also. Then they're back out in the community and they're not sticking on their medication, which can make a difference for them to be able to function in the community. Um, so the police, as, as Chief Livingstone mentioned, are... Um, frequently the, um, the go-to when things get really bad. So um, to elaborate on what um, they spoke about in terms of the CIT team, we also, there are some people in the community that may be known to various departments. Um, and so frequently between the police, fire, senior services, veteran services, and public health, 
we'll be checking in with one another when um, someone is popping up in one of our departments. So sometimes the police will be calling us, sometimes the senior center will be checking with the veteran services. So we do have a really good linkage between all the town departments. Um, that being said, there are not enough outpatient facilities, there's not enough outreach for folks who are experiencing um, this continuum of what they call the diseases of despair. So um, people struggling with anxiety and depression, people with substance abuse disorder, um, folks who are homeless. Um, some exciting things are happening recently that, that um, we're hoping will um, perhaps develop into some service for some people in, in the regional area. Um, but it is an ongoing challenge with no, with no easy answer. Paul. I, I'd just like to add to that. One of the things that, uh, Julie is an expert in this area, and one of the things that uh, she's reframed the way I think about this is that's not just a town of Amherst challenge. You have to look at this as a region, regional challenge, because we don't, uh, there are, there are homeless people in all communities. There are people suffering from these diseases in all communities. We happen to host a shelter, but it's a seasonal shelter, and other communities host shelters as well. But looking at it as a system of services and responses is really important. I'm not sure if you want to comment on that, Julie. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think another strength, oops, did I shut the back? Push, okay. Awkward for me. Um, so I talked about the strength we have within Amherst between our departments, but we also have a large strength in the wider region, um, partly through our homeless service networks. So in Amherst, I chair a homeless systems meeting where we bring folks around the table from Amherst and also some, some folks from outside of Amherst in Northampton or folks who work regionally. Um, and we also, um, participate in regional discussions, meetings, trainings, so that we're looking at this not just as an Amherst issue or problem, because some of the answers will lie in what can we do regionally. For example, having um, policies that are sort of region-wide among our shelters, improving communication between shelters, improving communication between mental health providers, things like that. So we're trying to build that up regionally. Um, and I think it is a strength out here in the Pioneer Valley that um, people do work well together regionally. There's not the territorialism you'll sometimes see that is often fueled by funding. Here we, um, we work well together. Good. I'm sorry to keep going on this one, but since you've been identified as probably one of our experts in the community, um, there were conversations going on about having our homeless shelter become part of a larger organization, which in my mind would have led to potentially um, better services and oversight. Um, I understand those conversations are not continuing, but do you see them reviving at any time? Well, that, that's about a particular piece of service. I think um, conceptually, yes. I think conversations with some entity, I don't know which specific, specific entity that would be, um, could happen. I think it's very hard for there to be a one-off shelter that's trying to support itself. So I agree that I think that's a good thing. I think that the shelter wants to stay strong and viable. So I think they're very open to pursuing that. Yes. Are, are the people who are in our shelter or in regional shelters, um, are most of them on Medicaid? Or would they have a Medicaid card? Or potentially have a Medicaid card? Um, well, there's eligibility for Medicaid, and yes, yeah. I would say most people are eligible um, because if you don't have any money, um, you're eligible, um, and most folks do not have any 
any source of income. Um, there are some folks who are on Social Security, and that makes you eligible for, for MassHealth. Um, I think one of the things that's difficult when you're homeless is keeping track of documents and um, also being able to go through all those procedures. Locally in Amherst, most of our folks are on MassHealth. Part of that is really due to Craig's Doors. Um, they do a great job with um, storing people's documents for them if they want to. Um, you know, they now have a trailer system that's open all year round. One of the real strengths of that is just having a bin with plastic dividers so if someone is in jail or is in rehab or has gone off for several months um, and left their documents behind or even knowingly said, hey, I'm, I'm going to be away for a while. Can you hold this for me? So that some people are really able to hold on to their documents longer. It's difficult when you're homeless. I just I should have given you a little yes. context. Um, the Medicaid program under the reforms that happened a while ago that we call ACA uh -huh. had a revision called a health home yeah. that states could apply for that particularly looked at mental health and homelessness and the interaction. And then there yeah. were some initiatives in pockets of the country yes. that got hospitals and primary care, including providing shelter, but it was trying to do what you're talking about, you know, creating networks that were supportive um, yes. to deal with the mental health, the substance, and also the chronic disease yes. issues that were contributing to the homelessness, but the homelessness was then contributing to the mental health, you know, as you said, the disease. So I just didn't know whether because it's a little bit easier in a pocket in an urban area, so I didn't know how much people had looked into grabbing the dollars that might be available if there are innovative people yes. in that. Yes, other. there are folks um, you know, who work full, while I may be seen as an expert, it's only because this is something I'm very involved in right in Amherst, so I'm constantly learning from those folks who are doing this full time. Um, and there are people who are trying to grab onto those dollars. That's right. Yeah, it's a very, very useful thing when you can get it. So, <clears throat> this, this is about SROs again, uh -huh. uh, and uh, I was reading something for these SROs to be effective, that mm -hmm. they should be trauma sensitive, like they should be designed, that mm -hmm. they are trauma sensitive. Mm -hmm. Is there something you can say about that? Um, I do know that um, Valley CDC, who's de designing the SROs, um, has a great reputation for being trauma-informed. I think that's what you're referring to. Um, and uh, the, the, the people, again, who, whom I am able to work with who've worked in homelessness for years feel um, that they are excellent at what they do. Um, and having been part of meetings, uh, one of the staff people from um, Valley CDC attends our homeless systems meetings. And over the past few years, I've been really impressed with her knowledge about how to do just that. Um, and I think that is in very important. Um, you, you can't just take a house and put people in it. It's more having the thought around how people will live together. So I feel really excited that um, they're the ones who are building the SROs. Anything else? Yeah, we should come back for a moment and talk about um, the Community Preservation Act proposal and our committee's role and uh, the um, other committee that has been referred to the community resources because I think the issues we'll look at are probably going to be different from the issues they're looking at, but this is all, they do connect. And so appreciate you bringing it up. Anything else from members of the committee? Appreciate it, and uh, you know, appreciate, uh, okay. appreciate your report and all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry if I'm a little rusty up here. <laughs> it's especially impre impressive when you said we're not a very big department. That was a very, <laughs> that was an understatement. <laughs> yeah. I, Small it, but mighty. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see the challenges uh, with marijuana in the year ahead. I know you and I have been through our prior service together on the Campus and Community Coalition. I've been thinking about that for right. some time, but yeah. it always seemed very distant, and now it's here. Yeah, it's here. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, last but not least, we have Ms. Nancy Pagano, who's going to, after 47 years, be presenting her last budget uh -huh. to the town. And also want to make sure that you have on your calendars June 14th, which is going to be a, a major um, farewell party for Nancy in the afternoon um, at the Bangs Community Center. And, uh, but today you're going to be talking to her about her budget for FY20, that she's setting up for her successor. Hello. Yes. So yes, um, my retirement is the last of three big retirements that have happened in the last two years. Uh, from a full-time staff of four, who each of us that are retiring have been there several decades, and um, because we fell in love with the people we serve and the job. So, a uh, longtime social worker, Maura Plant, retired, who I had worked with um, since she was hired a few decades ago. And then Karen Ehrman retired last year, and uh, now me. So, um, big changes afoot. So, we have, besides the four full time staff, we have two grant funded staff members. We have a lunch site coordinator paid for by, uh, we get a dollar for every meal that she delivers from her program and that pays for her wage. And um, we have a nurse who has her PhD and she works about 10 hours a week and she's totally funded by grants as well. In fact, um, there's a wonderful possible change coming in the it started this year. Um, you know, our whole budget, except for $1,775, goes to personnel. And the $775 was the fee for being part of the Mass Council on Aging, but now that's gone up to 803 And um, the other 1000 was for office supplies. And um, so, there's a grant offset, as you know, for our personnel funds from Elder Affairs. <clears throat> so Elder Affairs um, distributes money across the state to people who write grants, uh, cities and towns, based on the federal census, which in Amherst for 2010 was 4,015. So, um, last year, they were giving $10 for every elder, so we were expecting 40150 to go toward our, social, our newest social worker. But the governor, just at the last moment before he signed the budget, he cut that back by 1200 But anyway, um, now, we are expecting, because of the campaigning by the Department of Elder Affairs, Mass Council on Aging, to get $12 per elder, which will give us an additional, additional 9,000, um, 250, uh, which uh, Paul has been very gracious this year and has, been, has let us put that toward our nurse. <clears throat> so I want to speak about the funding for the nurse. Uh, every year, a resident at Applewood has given us $10,000 toward the nursing center. She's 97 and a half now. Her husband died. The two of them are philanthropists around the community in other ways, too. So anyway, um, Augmenting that for several years now has been 7,500 from the Friends to help pay for our nurses' outreach. We are really trying to wean the funding for the nurse off of the Friends, who uh, struggle to maintain all our, all our other um, needs. So this year, I did, uh, I was able to write two grants that were funded. One was from 
the Florence Banks um, Community Grant Program, we got $1,170, and from the Amherst Club, we got 250 So um, what I'm, I'm so thrilled that I'll be able, at least this year, to use that extra 9000 above the 40000 for our nurse, who's so important to us. And I'm, I'm hoping in my ask for the next fiscal year to have that continue. Uh, our nurse is very, very important to us. The biggest growth in our department is not in education and um, recreation. That changed several years ago. When I first started, that was the focus. Now the focus is social services. <clears throat> I would say that the needs of people as they grow older and they have suffer with various ailments, on, including depression, um, has taken so much of our energy and money and time. Food, stability, is the biggest program that we have. We, de we delivered to people 16,475 meals last year. That includes our UMass Meals Program and our Home Delivered Lunch Program. And we also served about 6,000 people at the Bang Center for lunch. The value of the food that we distribute um, in a variety of other programs comes to $213,533. That is the value of all the food from the various programs. One of the programs is our Wednesday free food giveaway where we have volunteers that go around the community and they pick up food and we lay it out um, and people bring their shopping bags and go through. We had 2,930 visits by people in the community uh, last year. People from foreign countries like China, Indonesia, Cambodia, Bosnia, Iran, Cape Verde, Russia, Germany. We are challenged by the languages. We are doing our best to have translators because not only is the, there's a cultural challenge about um, getting the food and fairly, so we, um, are trying to protect civility in that program. Uh, that program is our most challenging uh, food program of all the others we have, including the Survival Center Food Box and the Western Mass Food Bank Brown, program, uh, Brown Bag Program and our emergency pantry. Amherst, well, there are many people that are well-to-do we also have a tremendous amount of people who are insecure around food. And um, so we focus a lot of energy on that. Two new programs we have are trying to help people who are grieving. We have a new program called Life After Loss. And there are 43 people that have begun to participate. And then there's the LGBTQ program that has about a dozen people. Um, and uh, we try to get them connected with other gatherings in the community. Um, back to the food a minute, just to let you know that the growth on all our food programs is around 10% and is only going up. So um, another big program of ours is our convalescent loan closet program. Um, last year we donated, we distributed 460 pieces of equipment like wheelchairs and walkers, that kind of thing. It's a very uh, well-used program. We struggle with the space we have, but uh, it's very popular. In general, the in-kind total of all of the, all of the services and um, products and donations that we, we get, we add up for our Elder Affairs report comes to 550,161. 
the Friends Group has donated, and I have their spreadsheet about how much this year, this in FY18, they paid out of their money $35,744. So that went for things like buying convalescent equipment, um, conference fees and dues, postage, the newsletter, cups, plates, coffee, food, all kinds of things, presenters. The friends, you know, as you know, the law has changed, apparently, the tax law as an incentive for donors to um, have a break on their taxes. And uh, we are still monitoring how we're going to be impacted. It feels to me like our donations are down a bit, unfortunately. But, and we don't have a professional fundraising group. Uh, we have devoted group. Uh, they, do, they have many, many fundraisers, try to have one a month, um, but uh, we aren't big time like the Survival Center, unfortunately. We need to find just that right hook, and we, we just haven't found that yet. Um, maybe I should let you all ask me questions, um, and I'll try to answer. I do want to... You, I noticed you asked Julie about the, the um, impact of the Uzanti Health Center. And to tell the truth, I was very worried about it because we're the open door when you walk in to the bank center. And I thought that we would have a tremendous um, impact on our elderly receptionists. But we've had almost no impact at all. Um, so we had Eliza Lake over for our Council on Aging meeting and she assured us there that she's pleased with the turnout and the different zip codes represented. So um, I guess even though the signage is a problem on the front of the building, uh, folks are finding their way there. So that's a good thing. Just today, I met with their psychotherapist who are, is planning to um, start with taking over our clinic room one day a week and we'll move to two days a week um, after she assesses the need. And that's okay. We have a number of clinics, um, but so far we're not using the space every week on Wednesdays and Thursdays, so we are happy to oblige. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Anyone? In other words, one of the things that you've talked about for many times over the years has been uh, you've been monitoring the aid, the aging population in, in town and how you projected affecting the center in the future as you hand over to your, the, the problem to somebody else. <laughs> well, between 2000 and 2010, the number of people in town grew by 34.8%. We know already that in the 2020 census already, we have grown from 4,000 people in 2010 to about 5,000. And we expect the census will show somewhere between 5,300 and 5,500 people 60 and over. We know from our own survey that people do not want to leave Amherst. They love the services. And you know from Greenleaves and other developments that um, the issue is always affordable housing. There's a big problem in Hammerst with low-income housing, where the waiting list for Clark House and Ann Whalen numbers in the hundreds, and there are some people who have almost no income. And um, so I'm extremely concerned about that. I thought that when I participated in the charrette about the, um, that space 
between us and UMass, I thought maybe I planted a seed for low-income housing for elders. I think that's a huge need and um, documented need. And I'm very concerned that, you, that we don't have that. Um, I think that the rise of the Hadley Senior Center and some of the other senior centers in Northampton where the facilities include a gym, adequate um, counseling space, and space that is designed for older people without long hallways on one level, I think that um, makes those places attractive and when people can drive, they shop around. And I hear all the time people say to me, I was gonna come to your yoga class and I drove around and around and I couldn't find any place to park and I gave up. I would like to come to your programs, but parking is a huge impediment for me. We know that when we build a new senior center and we're on the list behind the other big projects, that we will probably quadruple in size. Um, we are considered a very unique regional multi-purpose senior center. 25% of our participants come from other communities. We mail our newsletter to Pelham because we have a grant from Highland Valley for that. I know people are clamoring to come here, but they're held back by the fact that our parking sticker is only available to people 65 and older who live in Amherst. So um, a lot of our volunteers are from other towns, the people who deliver the meals and do all kinds of things. So, that reality holds us back, and um, I just know that we're in a bit, when we're in a better spot, we're going to grow a lot, and um, we're grateful for what we have. I don't want to sound ungrateful. I'm so happy that we have the space we have, and it doesn't come out of our budget, and uh, we have IT, and they give us our computers and phones, and we don't have to worry about that. But I really wanted my legacy to be a new senior center. And I can only say I planted the seed. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else? Well, I appreciate it. I'm sorry that we kept you so late, but we're glad you okay. came to meet with us. And thank you. And thank you for all you do, and I'm going to miss uh, having heard many of your presentations in my various roles over the years. It's going to be quite a change. I love my job. I am so lucky to have found it right out of college, and um, I have a bittersweet feelings about retiring. Um, thank you so much. I'm sure, but... Um, Take it. Take it from a few of us on the board. There is a great opportunity out there somewhere. <laughs> well, I, I remain devoted to my home and get away from home, the senior center, the friends group, the trips as a fundraiser, and anywhere that can be helpful. I intend to be there to help. Um, and I'll try to be careful not to step on any toes of the new person coming in, but only to be an ally. And, Paul was counseling me on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your service. Okay. Um, so, um, the only other thing that was on the community services budget um, that wasn't covered by presentation, because there's really nobody but Paul to make a presentation on it, is the community services grant process. And, uh, so just to make sure that we... And there's the one small line called social services that doesn't yeah, seem to be linked that's to... that's the... Uh, it, it was like a free floater. Yeah. So do you have a vision for... I know you have a... Um, you've been working on the last year's amount, um, a vision for next year. And, so this is something I alluded to in my town manager report. So this is the 20,000 that's been in there for a long time. We've always had concerns about it because of the anti-aid amendment. 
Uh, last year, the town meeting put in an additional $60,000 for social services. Uh, I did not include the $60,000 in this year's budget. But I do think that it's something the council, as you start to discuss your goals for coming years, it is something you should put on your agenda to discuss because clearly town meeting has spoken towards funding social services uh, um, uh, more, more than we have in the past. Right now we, we do the $20,000 plus we do the 10% max that we're allowed to do under CDBG. Um, and then town meeting would put in the last two years put in an additional $60,000 and then we would sort of scramble and figure out how are we going to spend that money. There's, there's limitless needs. I think what the town had done in the past was to de dedicate it to certain nonprofits. We're not allowed to do that. That's illegal. You can't just say here's taxpayer money going to this nonprofit. That's called the anti-aid amendment. I think we've shared information about that in the past. But if the council uh, feels like putting more money into social services for whatever purpose, um, and you wanted to say, yes, we want to do that, I'd appreciate the guidance from the council as a goal uh, going forward. Or if you say, no, that's really not the function of local government uh, because um, and that's, that's I just, I'm looking for direction from you as you start to go through your goal setting process next in the fall, I, I assume is when you'll start to get, get involved in doing new goals for the coming year. Um, but just to be alert that uh, for two things, one is three things actually. One is we can't just say we're gonna give money to an agency because they do good work. Uh, the second is that we are anticipating next year's budget to be much more difficult than this year's budget. Uh, we had some one-time benefits this year that helped us sell, solve the budget challenge that we had, such as a virtual 0% increase in health insurance. That won't happen again. Uh, we had one-time mo money from a, a court decision called the Hopkinton case that allowed us to tax uh, construction earlier than we normally would. That was a one-time deal. And then the third thing is that if we put money into something else, we're going to have to take something out of something else. It's it's kind of a zero sum game. So it's, it's a it's a it's a big decision, um, and and again, look for the sort of policy guidance from the council on how you want to approach that. So long and short of it, it we we I kept the twenty thousand dollars in there. Um, I'm not going to let Sonia opine on that because I know what she thinks and um, <laughs> and, uh, and but we I did not include the sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, Kathy. Um, you know, I have a your your um, request that we think about this. Is, I think is a good one because even as we heard, police, fire, senior, leisure service, public health, we heard social services. You know, little pieces of it everywhere, um, and we're not even hearing about WIC. Uh, you know, meals on the meals on wheels. So there is this. It's not because of Amherst, it's nationally, it's this fragmentation of lots of little pieces and often it's services to the same human being. Just uh, except if everyone happens to meet each other when they walk through the doorway, <laughs> they don't necessarily even know they're visiting at different times of day. So figuring out if we only have a small amount of money, where it might, might be best used is what I, you know, so that's why it struck me even if it was 80, but when it's 20, it's like, would it be better in? And then look at one of the other things we have, but earmark it toward a population. You know, is it part of servicing the homeless? Is it part of servicing seniors who are homebound and falling and can't get up? So the ambulance is helping them stand up. You know, I, you know, I don't know. So trying to think of how would it be best be used as well as you said, um, who gets that money? You know, I mean, is it to what, where would you, it, could it be glue that helps pull something together? So, so we, I've had those conversations just staff-wise. Um, you know, we, we've talked about, um, there's endless needs, and, and you could say easily put a lot of money into any of these services because the federal government and the state government have pretty much walked away from their responsibilities in this area. It's fallen on local communities and we are a caring community so we do care about these things and invest money in these things. Um, you know, I, Julie during the budget process, she and I would, I would say, if you wanted to make a dent on 
the, the challenge of people who are suffering from homelessness is really big because it impacts every one of our departments. It's a thing that I hear from all of our staff, from conservation to the library, to the police, the fire, the DPW, they all are impacted in one way or another. Uh, and we're providing a lot of services or responding to uh, challenges from the homeless population. So, so, so we talked about what if we had $100,000 or whatever, what would we do with that money? How, would that have a tangible impact? And I think that's where Julie would kept saying, we can't look at it as just Amherst. We have to look at it as a system. And yes, we might be able to put some money in, and her um, advice would have been to, she had some ideas, I don't, I'd rather have her articulate what they are, but there were some part, things to hire someone to do stuff. And I think what my sense from the town meeting was when they voted was they wanted the funds to go to people, not to hire staff. And so I think that's the type of conversation that we would want to have. Uh, with a broader conversation with the council. Yeah, and I, I, when I asked the question of Medicaid, it wasn't so much can we, can we get them riled up, but it's a big pot of money that with entrepreneurial, creative people in some communities being used for some of these mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. because it's, it's much looser than Medicare is, but even on the Medicare side, there's some expanded take people that care people, better people at home where they live so we don't see them in the emergency room. So just trying to think of, uh, it's, we, I don't like to think of it about as other people's money because it's all of our money, but it's pulling in resources to help hold things together. Yeah. Um, I, would, I want to just go back historically. Not, um, some people here may remember this, but there was a time when the town of Amherst budget actually included a nice chunk of change that went to service agencies. And um, then we hit rough times and town meeting couldn't afford to put it there. And it became very difficult for those agencies that were dependent on that to wean away. And uh, some did and some did not. Um, so, uh, and I, having, I, I, as some of you know, I've kind of spent some of my life on both sides of this issue, now in government, but also on the other side of, you know, nonprofits that provide serious human services uh, to lots of people. And when you start mixing the dependence on local dollars, particularly, um, and even state and federal. With that, I get concerned about the ups and downs that that creates for that organization. And um, I, I think we see it, for example, our homeless shelter is totally dependent to almost completely on a state line item. And what happens if that state line item goes away? So I, I really, as much as I appreciate the fact that this is in here, what I also am hearing, Paul, and that is next year could be tougher. And if we're going to do something, let's do something that helps us figure out how to help others do something, not that we can take this on, but we can help do whatever we need to do. And I guess my summation on this, and this has been troubling for me too over the years because I was director of a nonprofit service provider for my career. Uh, town can't afford to do, to pick up where the state and um, the federal government are failing. We just aren't financially strong enough to do that. Uh, education is already um, a major pull and is going to continue to be. It's not going to get better. Um, we do know that um, the town meeting, there was a strong element in town meeting that felt very strongly about this issue, that the town had a responsibility to do something more. And at times, some years was successful in pushing that um, argument 
forward. Um, I bring this forward to our committee because when we hold our hearing, I wouldn't be surprised if we heard it. And, uh, but there is a reality that we all have to recognize in the, in, uh, the charter. Uh, we don't have the ability that the town meeting had to uh, make an amendment to create funding for a program that didn't, wasn't proposed already in the town manager's budget, which is different from the prior process. And so we have to be prompt to remind people of that. But um, on the other hand, we have to be very attentive to the community when we hear from them, because that's what our job is, as well as our own sense, which does get into the question of next year's goals and being realistic about it, but at least being aware of it. Uh, and so I appreciate the comments that were offered. Um, I want to touch on one other thing, just and that's planning for the next couple of meetings. I would uh, like to propose that we amend the agenda for next Tuesday, a week from today, and add to the agenda um, the topic of the short-term rental law community impact fee as referred by the council to this committee and one other committee. Um, and uh, if there's agreement, then I will I work. Agree. Um, I will work with uh, Sonia and we will do an amended agenda for next, for a week from today to add that item. And then um, if um, any of you have specific pieces of information that you think would be helpful to have for that discussion, um, as well as, as I pointed out, if you have questions about future presentations where you think that um, the staff will be presenting could, do, could provide anything in advance. We were very fortunate today. We had staff who really were just on top of everything, so we weren't left with questions. But don't hesitate to send me questions on any of that topic. Paul? So we weren't quite on top of everything. I gave you a, a not a complete answer on the um, question about police in terms of being trained. So what happens is when they go to the academy, we withdraw the money for the cost of the academy from their paycheck, and then after they've been here for five years, we reimburse them. So it is $3,000 for the cost that, of that. Thank you. That was, I was gonna, after we broke, say that would be a way to think about it, you know, that you've, exactly. I mean, that's, that's what a lot you. of private employers do when they're paying for the, you know, that we're training you, but. So I thank Sonia for pointing that out to me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, well, thank you. That may be why they rarely leave quickly. And is that okay, uh, uh, Paul, for you, if we add to the agenda for next Tuesday, that item? Now, we're meeting on Thursday. We're meeting on Thursday this week, but. Um, That's pretty I didn't sad. want to do it without having um, three days notice possibility because as I thought about it, there could be owners of um, homes that are being rented out as Airbnbs or other people who have vested interests. And if we haven't uh, provided um, notice as required by the open meeting law, um, I think we've opened ourselves up to something unnecessary. So that's why I would like to propose next yeah, Tuesday. Th I had a, I had a, you actually thought it would be next Tuesday because of that, you know, just a, enough advance notice, so. Yes, but I, need, I haven't, I need to dis, um, disclose it to the committee the thought and yeah. make sure that we had, the. Paul is okay with that too. So I assume that we do when we do our hearing that given the topic of the hearing, this would not necessarily be something on the hearing agenda. The short term yeah. rental I don't think that's on the agenda, no. No, because it's not, really, it's not part of the FY Right, exactly. Twenty proposed budget. We is, we did post it for public comment or last night's meeting, and when it comes back to the council, we'll post it again. But I agree with Andy that this is a useful time. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, 
don't want to put it on an agenda without statutory required notice. Okay, anything else? No. Motion to adjourn? I move. Okay, so uh, Second. everybody's agreed, so we're adjourning at 445. Thank you.